Tyler Akidao. I'm a software engineer at Google and also a member of the Apache Beam Project Management Committee. Hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Loïc Rice, and I'm a co-founder and CTO of TIZ, which is a video advertising company. And we're here today to talk to you about easily moving back and forth between batch and stream processing pipelines, depending on the characteristics, you know, business needs, et cetera, of, of that pipeline. So as far as our agenda goes today, uh, I'm going to do the first half, and then Loïc will take over after that. Uh, in the first half, I'm going to cover uh, basically unified model fundamentals within Cloud Dataflow and Apache Beam uh, that make it possible to easily switch between batch and streaming mode, uh, depending on whatever your use case is. So there's going to be four main sections there. One is I'm going to define you know, what do we mean by unified model. Uh, after that, I'm going to go into the infinite out-of-order data sets that really kind of underlie the, the, the whole reason that we need this unified model. I'm going to spend a bunch of time talking about the what, where, when, and how model that, that really enables this, this sort of thing. Uh, and then I'll finish up by summarizing how all this conceptual theoretical stuff enables batch and streaming interoperability, and then hand off to Loic. And I will discuss about uh, what we do at TIDS, uh, namely analyzing 30 billion events per day. And for that, I will start by talking a bit about uh, TIDS, the company, who we are, and what we do. Then I will explain the architecture we use for the past three years. Uh, with the issues and limitations we faced and the reason why we moved to a new solution. And I will describe this new solution uh, and uh, give you a few lessons uh, that we learned uh, along the way. All right. Thank you. So with that, I'll go ahead and get started. So before I actually dive into the stuff I talked about in the agenda, I want to clarify up front uh, kind of the, the systems I'm going to be talking about. So everything we're talking about here was originally part of uh, Google Cloud Dataflow, the system that we launched back in 2015. But uh, about a year ago, we actually, so there's two things that are in, in Cloud Dataflow. There's this programming model in SDK. So these are the APIs and sort of the conceptual way of, of building data processing pipelines. And then there's also this managed service. So this is the execution engine that runs your pipelines for you once you've written them, right? So about a year ago, we split these into two separate projects, essentially. So there's the programming model in SDK were donated to the Apache Software Foundation as an a fully community-driven open source project. And I'll be going into some of the details uh, about why that happened today. And then there's a, a couple talks that I'll reference later tomorrow that are going to go into much more detail about the community and sort of the motivations behind it and things like that. Um, and then the other portion, that, that managed service portion that, that lives within Google Cloud, remain Google Cloud Dataflow. So just so you have that context as I kind of talk about things, you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about. So what do we mean by a unified model? So uh, the, the beginnings of the need for this unified model really you can kind of trace back to early like 2011. So in 2011 time frame, stream processing was just starting to become a, a thing. Uh, and one of the things that happened with stream processing systems at the time, like Apache Storm, uh, was that they, they kind of made design decisions in order to reduce the latency that, that also reduced their ability to provide correct results. Uh, and so Nathan Mars, who wrote this blog post, who is also the, the creator of Apache Storm, uh, came up with this idea that, you know, we, we'd like to have low latency results of our system, but we also want them to be correct. And our streaming systems can't give us correctness. So instead, why don't we do this, this, this thing I'm going to call the lamp architecture, which is, you know, you've got your data set on the, on the left there, and you run it through some sort of stream processing system that gives you low latency, but not really correct results, like Apache Storm on the bottom, just calling it out because it's Nathan's system. Um, and then you run it also through a, a batch processing system that gives you strong, consistently, strong consistency, like Apache Hadoop on the top. You somehow merge the results together at the end, and, and you, you end up getting what you want, right? You want these low latency results that are eventually correct. Um, the downside is that you're, you're building and maintaining and then somehow merging the results from two separate systems. You know, this is costly among a, a ton of dimensions. And so one of the, the big goals we set out to have with, with Cloud Dataflow uh, and then Apache Beam was to, to come up with this unified model for doing this. So let you write your pipeline one time in one way that lets you take your data set and get your low latency but also eventually correct results. Um, but what also falls out from this is then once you've, once you've established this, this sort of a system, you know, it also allows you to, to, to choose the trade-offs that you want to make. So if, if you're kind of OK in a situation you know, using a batch processing engine on the back end and, and trading off some of that latency for, for greater efficiency, you can do that. Um, 
And so, so what you have is you've got your, your bean pipeline you've written, and you've got to run it on something, right? And so you can run it on a batch system, or you can run it on a streaming system. The, the choice is up to you. The big point is that you get to make this informed decision that lets you, you know, trade off these tensions between uh, balancing you know, correctness, latency, and cost. If you want to learn more about the details of this, we, we published a paper on this at BLDB in 2013. Uh, and so you can go look this up and, and read through it and, and sort of see the, both the details of the underlying model and, and really the, the conceptual motivations behind it. Uh, but it's not just about this you know, trading off between these, these different tensions uh, that, that really motivated us to create Beam. There's another aspect of it that's really important as well. Uh, and that is you know, this ability to run your pipeline really on any supported runner. And so it's not just batch or streaming, but really the, the choice of, of whatever execution engine is, is the best for, for you know, your specific use case. And then, of course, you're all here at this, this Google Cloud conference. Our goal as Google Cloud developer, or Google Cloud Dataflow developers, is to make Cloud Dataflow the absolute best place for you to go and run your Beam pipelines. Um, but we, you know, Beam allows you to, to have this, this open source way of, of accessing Cloud Dataflow that doesn't lock you into Google Cloud. You know, it's that open cloud sort of motivation there. And so you can come to Google, you've written your Beam pipeline, you hand it off, off to us in Cloud Dataflow, and you know, we run it through our optimizer that comes up with the best way to run it, possibly, schedules it machines, you know, brings up VMs, integrates cleanly with all the, the various portions of the Google Cloud. You know, and all of this is done within the managed service where you, you don't have to do any of the ops work to actually keep all this up and running. So that's sort of the, the rough introduction to you know, what we meant by the unified model and, and where it came from. So next, let's look at uh, infinite out of order data sets, because these were really, these were really the motivating reason for needing this unified model. Um, so in order to do this, I'm going to kind of ground things in a, a Concept or a, a concrete example. So imagine you are uh, some startup. You've created some new cool mobile game where you know, users go on their phones and they crush candy or kill orcs or, or whatever. And as they do this, you know, you're, you're collecting logs about the things they're doing. Like, and, and through our example, the, the biggest thing is we're going to say we're collecting user scores, right? And we want to be able to, to tally up user scores and team scores and basically analyze the data and, and understand how people are using our product. So. We start out with a data set. So this is, you know, this is sort of representing the logs from our games, right? And each of these little squares is one user score. Um, and as our, our game gets more popular, our data set may get bigger. Uh, and then eventually, it may get so big that we start organizing into some sort of repeated structure, right? Like we, we start collecting logs for a given day. You know, so Tuesday's logs, then Wednesday's logs. But really, this is just sort of a, a cheap way of representing a, an infinite data source. Um, and these, uh, the, game, the game logs are continuous, so really you want to treat them in a continuous manner. Um, what's worse, because we're dealing with distributed systems here and we're dealing with mobile devices, um, there's ambiguity involved. So let's look at a few of these uh, scores. So we're going to look at three different scores from, from different gamers that all happened conceptually you know, at 8 AM. So all of them were on their phone at 8 AM and, and you know, made these scores. So this first one, this red one here, happened, happened at 8 AM. And you can see within our, our big unbounded stream of data here, it showed up pretty close to ADM. So that's great. Uh, and then this yellow one, it was delayed a little bit, but it also showed up roughly close to, to 8 AM. But then somebody representing this, this green square was you know, on a plane or something in airplane mode. And they, they'd scored the score at 8. But it wasn't until you know, whatever that is, five, six hours later, that they, they actually took the phone out of airplane mode and were able to upload that score. So this is what I mean when we talk about out-of-order data sets. Like, conceptually, that, that score happened back a lot closer to where these two happened. But we didn't learn about it until hours later. Um, so now we've got this infinite, unbounded, out-of-order out of uh, data set. How do we process it? Well, there are a few different ways that you can approach this, um, depending on what your pipeline's doing. So the, the most simple, simple kind are element-wise transformations. So, uh, with element-wise transformations, you know, you're just doing things on an element-by-element -element basis. So in this case, we're, we're basically filtering out everything except for the yellow elements. Uh, you don't have to look at anything other than a single element at any given time, so it's relatively straightforward. Uh, another way to do this, you know, once you start wanting to do an aggregation, you've got to group your, group your elements together somehow over time. So one way to do this is to aggregate them into processing time windows. So, you just basically break apart time as elements arrive, as sort of they're observed in the stream, and say, this is my window of time. I'm going to treat this as you know, a, a group of elements together. 
It's the simplest way to do it. But it also means if your elements are arriving out of order, they may be processed within groups that they don't really relate to. So if you remember that green element we had that showed up you know, way more like 1 o'clock in the afternoon, we, we would account that with all these, these other events that happened around 1 instead of with events that happened around 8 like we should have. So what we would really want uh, when, you have, when you're dealing with, with out of order data is event time windowings. So Event time windowing lets you take this unordered stream of data and effectively perform a time-based shuffle to put these, put these elements that arrive out of order back into the order they should have been and aggregate them together with the elements that, that you know, they belong with. Uh, but to do this, we really need to formalize uh, the relationship between processing time and event time. So what we have here is, is a graph, and we're going to actually look at a bunch of graphs throughout this, this presentation. But uh, on the x-axis, we have event time. So that's in blue. Uh, so this is when the events actually happen. So the, the user's on their phone playing their game, and they, you know, they, they scored some, some points, and they were recorded. That's the event time. The processing time is then when the events show up in the system. We learn about them and process them. Um, and that dashed line up in the middle would be the ideal. You know, if, if events happened and were processed at the same time, they'd all lie on that ideal. But reality is a little more like this red curve where you know, because of distributed systems, because of delays in, in, from mobile, mobile uh, phones, et cetera, uh, you kind of get this wandering, meandering line that sometimes comes close to the ideal, but oftentimes skews away from it. Um, and really, this, this horizontal distance between uh, the ideal and uh, this, this red line, this represents the skew in event time. So, so how far off are we from, from the ideal as far as you know, completeness in event time? Uh, and in order to reason about completeness and correctness, we need to be able to understand you know, where that skew is. And so uh, we do this with a thing called a watermark. And the watermark essentially tries to capture the notion of this red line. It, it describes you know, progress of event time completeness within the system. It's, it's roughly a guarantee that no timestamp earlier than the watermark will ever be seen again. Now, you can actually have two types of watermarks depending on what your import, what input source is. If you have complete knowledge about your input source, you're actually able to provide a perfect watermark, which means this literally is a guarantee. You will never see a timestamp earlier than the watermark. Because we deal with distributed systems or system, you know, systems like, in our case, where we are reading from or we're uh, accepting you know, mobile, mobile phone uh, scores, we have no way of knowing you know, all the mobile phones out there that, that might be having scores made on them at a given time and then uploaded later. In that case, you often have to create watermarks that are heuristic-based. Uh, so you, you, you sort of take all the information you know and make the best estimate you can of what the watermark is. And then uh, in that case, you, you may actually be wrong, and you'll have to deal with that. So there's two problems, then, that they're listed here at the bottom with watermarks. One is that they can be too slow. If, you know, if you're accurately holding back the watermark because you know there's late data, that's fine. But it also is kind of you're, you're essentially holding back progress of the system, waiting for this, this, these records that you know are late. The other is that they can be too fast. So the case of having a heuristic watermark, uh, if your heuristic is wrong, if your, your guess is, is off, you'll say, oh, yeah, the watermark has advanced to time x, but stuff, stuff with, with a timestamp before x may show up later. So that's, that's a case of it being too late. So we'll look at ways that we address this in the future. But that leads us to this next section. So, so, uh, so how do we deal with these, these issues? Well, it's not, not quite so hard if you actually know what kinds of questions to ask. So what we've done with Apache Beam and, then, and Cloud Dataflow is, is try to provide a system that lets you think about your data processing problem by answering these four simple questions. So what is it that you're computing? You know, are you creating sums? Are you doing joins? Are you building histograms, machine learning models? This is sort of the... the the, the question that you've traditionally probably thought about answering with you know, classic batch processing. Uh, but beyond that, when you want to start dealing with these unbounded data sets, there's a few other questions you want to start answering. So where in event time are you actually performing these calculations? Because when you have an unbound, you know, this infinite unbounded data set, you can't just assume that you'll wait till you see the end of it, because there may be no end. You're going to have to chop it up some way. And then you know, after you've defined where in event time this is happening, uh, when in processing time do you actually emit results for it? Like, do you wait until you're, you think your inputs are complete? Uh, do you want to give speculative results over time that sort of show your answer is evolving? And in cases where you have late data, what, what do you do if, if data show up late? Do you throw them away? Do you incorporate them in? You know, how do you deal with this? Uh, and lastly, then, you know, in cases where you do provide multiple results, uh, how do those refinements of those results relate over time? 
so we're going to go th now through kind of examples of each of those questions um, and see what I mean in more detail. So for the what question, what are you computing? We, we talked previously about, you know, there's element-wise uh, operations, there's aggregations, there's also this notion within Beam of composite operations. So, so taking a, a set of uh, sort of more primitive operations and turning them into a, a higher level concept like a sum, right, which is kind of a grouping and then a, you know, addition operation, reduction. Um, so for our example, we're going we're gonna to look through some code here. This is pseudo Java because it needs to fit on slides. And uh, we're going to elide a lot of this as we go. But the basic idea is you know, we're reading some log lines. So that's that first line. We're reading them into a P collection. The P collection is the beam and data flow notion of a, a massive potentially massive collection of data. Uh, then we're going to apply these transformations to it. So first we're going to apply a parser that's going to parse it into this key value uh, pairs of, of strings and integers. So these are going to be team score pairs because we're going to want to compute team scores here. And then lastly, we're going to apply this composite sum dot integers per key operation, which is just going to compute these per, per team scores for us. And so uh, for each of these examples, we're going to have, again, a, you know, an event time on the x-axis green uh, y-axis processing time graph. Uh, and each of these circles here represents a single score from a single user on the same team. We're looking at one, one team at a time, just because otherwise it'd be three-dimensional and this is enough to deal with. Uh, and so this dashed line will, will sort of represent that ideal, if you remember from the, the watermarks uh, slide I had earlier. Uh, and you can sort of see you know, where these relate relative to that ideal. Like this, this score of three was really close, relatively close to it. So it happened, uh, happened around. What is it? I can't tell from here. 12, almost 12.07, and it arrived not too shortly thereafter. But then you've got like this 9 example. This, this one actually showed up uh, quite a while after, it, after, it, uh, after the event actually happened. So you can see there's that, that much greater skew from the ideal. And so we're going to look at a few different animations. So this is just the, the sort of the initial pipeline we talked about where we read in data and then we compute a sum. And so what's happening here is there's this thick thick line coming from the bottom. The animation just loops, so you can kind of watch it over and over. This thick white line ascending up the bottom represents time as we observe it, as the pipeline observes these data coming in. So as the line reaches one of the elements, it's basically seeing that element and incorporating it into the sum, which you can see uh, accumulating there in the middle. And once it gets to the top, uh, it computes its answer, and uh, the rectangle turns blue, and it materializes the result. Right. Uh, so this is pretty standard batch processing. So let's make it a little more interesting and, and move forward and, and start answering some more questions. So the first question I want to touch on is where in event time. So the answer to, to the where question is, is windowing. So windowing is a way of dividing data up into event time finite-based chunks. So this lets you get your, your temporal chunking within the data, within this infinite data stream, so that you can know where, to, where, you know, where you're actually calculating within a finite set of the data. There's a few, you know, a number of different examples of, of types of windowing. Uh, I have three up here, uh, fixed windows, where you, know, you basically just slice up the data into fixed, you know, say, hourly windows or 10-minute or windows. Sliding is a lot like fixed, except you, you slide a little bit each time. And so uh, the interesting thing there is that the windows start to overlap. And then sessions are a very interesting uh, example of windowing that we won't, won't go into detail here, but basically they're, they're based off the data themselves. So you can't know ahead of time what sessions are. They actually try to capture uh, some quality of the data itself. So usually it's defined as you see a sequence of activity for a given key, like for a given user. You know, they're, they're active on your website, and you, you group them into groups of activity that then terminate when the user stops interacting with your service or whatever. So you can kind of see these bursts of, bursts of activity of a user, and they allow you to, to reason about engagement levels and things like that. So they're very powerful and uh, very interesting. Uh, but let's, let's, uh, let's go ahead and add some windowing to our pipeline here. So in order to do that in Beam, you, you just simply add this, this uh, uh, windowing transform in, and it's, it's, it reads quite plainly, you know, windowed into fixed windows of, of two minutes long. And so if the, we then go back to our animated example, again, running this on a batch system, uh, you can see instead of, instead of accumulating a single result, we've, we've now sliced it up into uh, two-minute slices of event time. So in this case, we're, we're looking at about nine minutes of data, so we end up with four different scores across four two-minute windows. Uh, and again, as before, this is a batch pipeline, so we wait until we've seen all the data and get our results uh, at the end. Uh, but the whole point of this, this talk is to talk about being able to switch between batch and streaming. So let's see what it takes then to then you know, take this and, and move it into streaming. 
So once we want to move into streaming, you know, we can't wait until we've seen all the input in order to, to produce results. So we've got to somehow figure out a way of, of producing results earlier than that. And that's when we start to answer the when question. You know, when in processing time do we materialize re these results? And we do that with this thing called triggers. So triggers control when results are emitted. So what we'll do to begin with is we'll, we'll add a trigger that says we're going to trigger when the watermark passes the end of the window. This is effectively the, the, the default trigger, so we wouldn't need to specify this. You could actually use the, the code from the previous example in a streaming pipeline and, and get this effect. And this is also effectively the same thing that's, that's happening when you run in batch mode. Uh, but if we do this in, in a streaming example, then, uh, we'll look first here at, at a perfect watermark example. So in this case, we have a watermark represented by that dashed green line, uh, which is a perfect watermark, so it's, it's going to guarantee us that we never see late data. And basically what happens is the system waits until the watermark passes the end of the window. And once it does, it knows, OK, I'm never going to see any more data for, the, for this window, so it's OK to go ahead and materialize the result for it. So you can see, as before, we get our, our four results of 14, 22, 3, and 12. Uh, but it does so in this sort of incremental fashion as the, the data for those windows become complete. And in this way, it allows you to, to continually process an unbounded stream of data and give you results that, that kind of come out as they go. Now, let's look at another example here next to it uh, of a heuristic watermark. So let's imagine we have a watermark that's not perfect. And as you can see, it looks, it looks different than the, than the dashed one. This solid green watermark is a little more aggressive. And it actually gets it wrong. Like, it, it, it doesn't know about that 9 that ends up showing up late. And so what happens here is that you know, time progresses on. And we emit our windows as they come. But in that first window, it, it thought it was complete when it saw the 5. And the watermark advanced. And then later, along came the 9. And there's nothing the system could do about it. Like, it just it had already produced results, so we got the wrong answer. We said 5. The answer should have actually been 14. So how can we deal with that? So triggers provides ways to deal with, it, to deal with this. So in this case, we can, we can make our trigger a little more, a little more complex to, to deal with the subtleties of, of our, our specific data set. So in this case, we've added two, new, uh, two, two modifications to the watermark trigger. We've said, well, we want early firings every minute of processing time. So this is basically going to give us speculative results uh, as our data evolve. And then also to deal with that, things like that late 9 that showed up, we're going to say, you know, if we ever get late data, we're going to go ahead and, and uh, trigger a firing again anytime we see one. We don't expect a whole lot of late data, so we'll just do it anytime we see a ca an element count of 1. And that way, we will account for uh, these late records showing up. So if we then use this trigger, we can see that our two examples now look like this. Uh, the nice thing here is that uh, in the heuristic watermark case, when that late 9 shows up, you can see we go ahead and incorporate it, and it gets incorporated into a late result. Oh, and each of the panes here uh, is annotated with you know, whether it's an early result or an on-time result or a late result. Um, another interesting feature of this you can see is that uh, it kind of helps with that, that, that too slow problem of watermarks that we talked about earlier. So without the early watermark, you kind of had to wait you know, almost 10 minutes to get the it, get an answer of that first window in the perfect watermark case, even though you knew it was at least five early on. Whereas with this additional early trigger that we put in here, you start to get these speculative results that let you see your results build up over time. Uh, so that brings us to the last question here. So how do refinements relate? When we start having multiple panes uh, within a window, how, how do the, the, those panes relate to each other? Uh, so we're going to look through an example here where uh, we're going to have three trigger firings, a speculative firing, a watermark firing, and a late firing. Uh, and for each of those, you can see which elements have showed up. So we, the speculative firing will include a value of 3. The watermark firing will include a 5 and a 1. And then we'll get a late firing with a, a value of 2. And we'll look at each of the three uh, different modes that we have here to deal, deal with uh, defining how refinements relate. So the first one is discarding mode. Uh, or another way to think of it is the sort of delta mode. So uh, when uh, when the trigger fires, we throw away whatever state we've built up, whatever sum we've accumulated, and kind of start, start over again from zero. And so you end up with these panes, 3, 6, and 2, that don't really relate to each, to each other in any way. Uh, you know, the last observed value has nothing to do with the sum, even though we're comp computing sums. But if you sum them up individually, you do get the final sum. So this is, this is useful for cases where your outputs are actually going into another system that's doing some further aggregation. Uh, the second one, which is what we've seen all along, is accumulating mode. Uh, which actually 
holds on to that, that state that you've seen. You can think of this as, as maybe a value mode. You know, it, gives, it gives you the current value every time. So we see three first time, then five and one show up. You add those together, and the next time the value is nine. So every time you can just kind of replace the previous value with the new value uh, to get you know, what is current. Uh, and so that's why you see the last observed there is, is 11 at the end. It gives you that correct result. The downside with this system is, uh, if you actually sum those up themselves, uh, you, you kind of double count. So you have to make sure that this is used in a system where you can overwrite previous values, where there's not going to be any you know, accumulation. The one that you really want, uh, which we don't have quite implemented yet, but uh, is accumulating and retracting mode, which, which, which gives you essentially accumulating mode, but also every time it gives you a new value, it gives you a retraction for the previous value. It says, like with that, that on time firing, it says, well, you know, previously I'd said the value was three. We'll take that away. You retract that, and also here's the new value of nine. So that allows you to, in situations where you, you know, there may be further aggregations down the pipeline, uh, you can actually get this, the correct result uh, that way. Or if you just look at the last observed non-retraction value, you also get the, the, the correct result. Um, so we'll look real quickly at what uh, adding a retracting mode uh, does to the pipeline. Uh, so this is our same example from before. Uh, but now every time we, we fire a non-initial pane, uh, you see we get two panes. We get both this, the, the new result in yellow and then also this retraction uh, in red that's saying, you know, the previous value that I told you before, we'll go ahead and get rid of that because I was wrong. Uh, and that allows you to, to, to really properly update results over time even with, without having to just blindly overwrite a uh, previous value. All right, so before I hand off to, to Loic to, to hear about more concrete examples of this, I want to talk very quickly about uh, how all this uh, enables batch and streaming interop. Uh, so it really comes down to, to two things that are provided by the system is this ability for correctness uh, in light of you know, changing inputs or different types of inputs and, and different ways of, of processing those inputs under the covers, and then the flexibility afforded by the model to, to make those choices. So on the, on the correctness front, uh, you know, we, we've talked about distributed systems and, and how they're, you know, they're distributed and, and sort of you, you never know what you're going to get. So to really quantify this for us, let's, let's look at two examples of how we might have observed these events. So you can see they're shifting up and down between this, this white set of input records and this purple set. You'll notice that they aren't shifting in the x-axis. These, these are the same events. They happened at the same time. We're just changing the order in which we observe them within the pipeline. We're changing their processing time. So if we were to process these records using processing time windows, where you just sort of view them as they come in, what effectively is happening is you're taking those events, you're throwing away the event time, and you're shifting them onto the ideal. You're saying, you know, when I saw this event, I'm going to treat that as its position in the window. So you're, 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 I seem to, you're mapping processing time uh, onto event time and then summing things up. And you can see when you, when you change the ordering then, you get different results. So the first window in ordering number one, you get a result of 12. In ordering two, you get a result of seven, which isn't what you want. Whereas if you use event time windowing, where you actually uh, you know, aggregate and process these events within the, events, the event time windows when they happened, you get the same result no matter what the, the processing time ordering. Now, the actual shape of results over time as they sort of evolve may be different. Like that's just a characteristic of how your data arrive. Uh, but at the end of the day, you come up with the same results. And this is a key part of how you can provide a system that, that operates the same, even if it's in streaming mode or in, or in batch mode. Uh, the second part is flexibility. So you know, the, the five examples we've walked through, you, know, you can see how the system gives you the flexibility to choose the ones that work for your use case. And specifically, when we're talking about switching between batch and streaming, there were three cases there that, that gave you the same final results no matter whether it was batch mode or in streaming mode. And if you don't care about late data, really there were four. Um, and so, um, and we did this you know, with relatively minor code changes. I don't expect you to be able to read this, but the point is that you know, we didn't make a whole lot of different changes to, to kind of fit these different use cases. And the, the really important point is that we never, we never changed our core algorithm, that sum of integers per key. And this is true no matter how complex your algorithm is. You, you define what it is you're computing, and then everything else you may need to change uh, in slight ways to tweak it for batch or streaming uh, is totally independent of that, uh, which really gives you the flexibility to cleanly switch between the two. So I've now given you sort of the, the theoretical conceptual foundation for why we can support this switching between batch and streaming. I'm going to now hand off to Loic. 
who's going to give you a little more uh, concrete details of how they've done that uh, with their system at Teats. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. So, yeah, you write uh, the proposal my talk to, uh, today uh, is going to be to give you a feedback uh, of our usage of data flow, but also uh, BigQuery and more broadly about uh, GCP. So, as I mentioned in the intro, I will start by talking a bit about TIDs. Uh, so, TIDs, uh, we created TIDs in 2011, and uh, we now have 27 offices in 21 countries in the world. Uh, last year, we uh, achieved 200 million of revenues. We have 500 employees, and among them, 90 plus of them are from the R&D team. And uh, what we do, uh, we try to solve a major issue this uh, advertising industry has, which is the scarcity of premium video inventory. Only 5% of online video in inventory is premium. So we've created a format uh, to uh, fix uh, this issue. So I have a quick video to uh, show you the format in action. So this is the end read. So you probably came across this format. So uh, it's a way to embed video within editorial content. Uh, so as you can see, the video is paused when it's not visible and it's playing only when it's visible. And you can tap on the ad to see, to see it full screen uh, with sound on. Okay. So let's move on to the next slide. With uh, the simple format, uh, in fact, we've been able to solve an uh, issue for the three main actors of this industry. So first, the publishers. Uh, there's a lot of publishers that uh, they, they have a lot of uh, textual content. A, they want to monetize this content through video. So with uh, this format, uh, from one day to the other one, they could monetize all their content with video. For advertisers, they want to have a viewable ad, which is uh, what the Inread does by design, and they want to be displayed within uh, premium content, which we bring with the publishers that we have. And finally, the publishers, uh, the users, we try to create the format in such a way which is not uh, intrusive, which is engaging for a user. And uh, this way, uh, you can skip the ad if you're not interested, or you can uh, activate the sound if you are interested, and only if you are if you are interested in the ad. It's not working. Uh, so uh, today we are the number one video marketplace in the world. And uh, we can see on this graph the kind of growth that we had uh, during the past uh, years. It started in 2000, 2012 uh, until now. And today, we reach more than 1.2 billion users uh, every month. So we are also uh, within uh, the club of uh, uh, websites reaching more than 1 billion uh, users. So the question is, what do we do with uh, this kind of data? So nothing fancy here. We do BI for internal purpose. Uh, we do also analytics. Uh, so we provide uh, publishers and uh, advertisers uh, with a dashboard so they can understand their website, they can understand how their ads are performing. We do also, uh, we optimize our algorithm uh, through machine learnings. And uh, I have a few other use cases, but the last one I would like to mention is the fraud uh, detection. So we started in 2012, and uh, as Tyler mentioned, uh, back then, uh, the quote from uh, Nathan Marx was the reference, um, and uh, basically is, is, uh, Nathan, Nathan is explaining in this quote that uh, uh, data system has two main features. The first one is the storage. We need to ingest all the data. 
And the second one is uh, the way we retrieve and bring the result to the end users. But we have to keep in mind that this kind of systems have a lifetime, which is uh, pretty long. So for us, uh, it's, our system is running for six years and even more. And therefore, we need to find a way to uh, overcome any kind of hardware failure that could occur, uh, any kind of human mistakes, even though we try to avoid them, uh, sometimes uh, it happens. So that's why it's really crucial to store uh, raw data. And once you have raw data, you can simply uh, apply a function to it, and you can have your end result. So this is perfect, but uh, the issue is that all data means a few petabytes of data, so it's not uh, applicable in real life. So to solve this issue, you need to create some views, pre-computed views, to uh, accelerate the queries. So every time you have a new use case, uh, a new client asking for something, you need to create a new view to uh, support uh, this new use case. So we ended up uh, operating and managing a Lambda architecture. So this is a Lambda architecture by, by the book. And for us, uh, we are using we were using Amazon Web Services, so we uh, are using Kafka for the queue messaging. Then the data uh, has two ways. The first one uh, for the batch layer. So the first step is to store the data so we can be safe. Uh, the data uh, is there. So for that, uh, we use what we call the fetcher, and we store data on S3. And then the batch mode is computed, uh, is computing all these views uh, on these uh, rollups. And we used to do it uh, in MapReduce, then we moved to Spark, and we store the end result uh, in Cassandra. On the bottom of uh, these charts, you have the speed layer. So for that, we use uh, Storm. And once again, uh, the data is uh, outputted in Cassandra. And uh, for the final result, we are using uh, a tool that we call reporting that's merged the data. So if the data is available in batch mode, we are uh, taking this one. Otherwise, we are fallbacking on the real-time data that has been computed uh, through Storm. So. This kind of uh, architecture is uh, pretty great because uh, you can fix any kind of issues. Uh, if uh, you have stored the data, you can recreate it from scratch. So you can just uh, discard the batch data and then uh, use the raw data to compute the new views and you're fine again. You fix the issues. And cherry on the cake, you can even create uh, views for needs you didn't uh, think of previously. Uh, because you have the data to support this. Few numbers. Uh, so I should have mentioned that we are using uh, Hadoop for both uh, the Spark jobs and then to uh, use the reporting. So there's two usage uh, for the Hadoop cluster. Uh, we have a Hadoop cluster of around uh, 120 nodes. Our Cassandra cluster is around 60 nodes and we ingest every day around four uh, terabytes of uh, data. And this is done only with a team of three people. So with this kind of scale, uh, you start to face some limitations. So just to name a few, uh, the numbers of view you need to create to uh, support all uh, your client needs tend to grow very fast. So you have to create a lot of them. And therefore, uh, when there's a mistake and you need to recompute all those views, it's quite expensive. You also need to create some uh, internal uh, jobs to add some uh, steps to bring the end result. And therefore, you, are, you ended up with a lot of complexity. And finally, uh, not the least, because you are managing those big clusters, uh, it uh, involves a lot of work in terms of uh, monitoring, automation, uh, and so on. So it doesn't scale magically. So we started to think about uh, an ideal solution for us. 
which would be uh, using only one single unified view. And therefore, with this uh, view, we could uh, have all the combinations uh, possible and combine all the dimensions uh, with it. We wanted uh, it to be really fast, to be able to compute those views in minutes, uh, not days. And uh, finally, if possible, uh, it would be manageable, more manageable than uh, the previous system. And why not managed by someone else, if you see what I mean. So that's why we tried uh, to run a POC with BigQuery. So as uh, our data were laying on S3, we just uh, transferred the data to GCP uh, using uh, data, data transfer. And then, uh, because at the time uh, Pocket was not supported, we added a step with Dataproc to uh, convert data and ingest uh, the data in BigQuery. So since then, uh, packet support has been developed. So it would be easier uh, if I had to do it now. Once you have the data, you can try to play with it and uh, to create this unified view we were eager to have. So this is how the data looks like when we try to ingest it. There's uh, basically a timestamp and a few ideas. Uh, so, advertiser, uh, advertisement ID, uh, website ID, there's uh, tens of them. And uh, finally, there's uh, the event. So, the first thing we can do is uh, try to compress the data because we do not uh, provide reports per minute but per hour. So, we could get rid of uh, the timestamp and replace it by the hour plus a counter. This is the first step, which is fine. But we can go even deeper. And uh, something we want to do is to uh, use a dedicated column for uh, every kind of event uh, that we can have. So uh, have a column for impression, a column for start, and finally another one for clicks. And this way, we can go from uh, four rows in the first example to only one with uh, three counters, uh, two impressions, one start, and one click. And uh, you can uh, leverage the columnar uh, storage system of BigQuery, uh, because if you want to query uh, only impressions, you can uh, just uh, read those integers instead of having to scroll and read uh, a string, uh, which is way faster. And uh, as the data is quite similar, uh, it's a good use case for compression. So this way, we've been achieved to compress the data by 70x. And we try to run query to it. So we've been impressed by the performance of BigQuery. And uh, we, in fact, achieved better results and better performance uh, on this hourly rollup uh, than the previous uh, system, even though it was optimized for query. So with this success, we moved on to the next step, which involves uh, data flow, which is uh, the live uh, ingestion of the data. So as we have uh, this queue messaging, uh, Kafka, we just plugged uh, data flow to it. So keep in mind that we are using two different cloud providers. So data flow is responsible to retrieve the data to AWS from AWS and to insert it in uh, BigQuery. So it was really, really easy to do because we performed very few uh, modifications on the data, and it was working fine. But uh, there's a few challenges that I would like to discuss. Uh, the first one is, uh, I think, pretty obvious. Uh, having two clouds adds a bit of complexity. So we need to handle this. We need to avoid creating uh, the same stuff plenty of times. Uh, so for instance, you have the, your rights on one cloud provider and the same one on the second one that need to be kept in sync. Uh, same goes for network configuration and so on. So we are investing a lot in uh, Terraform. And uh, I think uh, you should do the same if even though you only operate on one cloud uh, provider, it's a good use, uh, usage of your time. 
And a uh, second uh, issue uh, that we faced uh, is not really linked to data flow, but more uh, to BigQuery. So data flow uh, is uh, really fast and pretty cheap. But when you are trying to ingest raw data, uh, which means more terabytes per day, uh, the streaming mode of uh, BigQuery could be a bit expensive. And we start to think about those questions that we mentioned. Do we need to go to stream or batch? And we, we acknowledge that it was not the right to use case for the streaming mode. So we switched to what we call the micro batch, uh, meaning a batch every 15 minutes, uh, which is fine for our use case. And we also think about other uh, solutions like sampling the data when it's uh, technical metrics, when you just need the trend and not exact value, and this kind of stuff. So this is the end result. Uh, you have your timeline with the events. Uh, the color is uh, representing the hour of uh, data generation. So for us, it's mostly uh, ordered, but uh, you could have uh, late events. And we just read a batch of uh, data, a chunk of data, uh, using Dataflow and write it to BigQuery. So without uh, a lot of uh, modifications, just a few checks and uh, casting. And then we are leveraging the SQL uh, power, and we create those rollups I mentioned before. And we are separating the data from the hour of 7 a.m. from uh, 8 a.m., and we write those in two different tables. And then, as time goes by, there's new events that need to be processed. So first step, uh, ingestion on uh, BigQuery using Dataflow, and then we append the data. And you can see, I guess you've understood the principle. OK, so this is the overview and the final, uh, final architecture. So Kafka, uh, data flow consuming the data, writing it uh, to BigQuery, then applying a SQL query to generate those rollups. And uh, we can go even deeper uh, with new queries to create specialized uh, data maps for specific needs uh, in case of we need those. So I just want to uh, go back. I mentioned this before, uh, the fraud uh, detections. So right now we have a loop, uh, which uh, is every hour. We are retrieving the data, and we are checking uh, to see if there's any fraud or anomaly detections. And we think this is the perfect use case to leverage the streaming mode of Dataflow and try to uh, speed up a bit this uh, feedback loop to have uh, faster feedback results. So in terms of uh, results, uh, we've been able to shrink our, our cluster. So the Hadoop cluster, uh, or the equivalent of Hadoop, goes from 120 nodes to 32 nodes. We no longer need uh, Cassandra, and we are using a BigQuery, which is managed, so no nodes uh, to manage. You can see there's more dat uh, data on BigQuery because uh, we do no longer need to discard the raw data, uh, and we can keep it on BigQuery and use it uh, when we need it. Volume is the same, team size is the same. And this, uh, the POC plus the pilot, has been done in only four months. So, uh, few more slides. Uh, in terms of scale, we were reaching the limits. We were wondering if it was possible to, to scale to the next level, because it took us uh, around 40 minutes to compute one hour of data. So uh, we were uh, wondering if it was possible to scale. And now we know for sure that's the case, because we tried with 10 times more data, and it's working fine. And in fact, the times to process one hour of data have been down to only four minutes. So four batch of one minute, four minutes, which is impressive. 
In terms of cost, uh, it required, used to require a lot of maintenance to handle those uh, big clusters, and uh, it was uh, pretty expensive. So now we've delegated basically all this job to BigQuery and to Google, so it's managed for us. So the cost of uh, operational uh, have been down to close to, to zero, and we are now now under control uh, regarding the cost. Uh, something I would like to mention is that uh, the cost has been reduced, even though we have around 20% uh, around of the overall cost, which uh, is the egress to transfer the data from uh, one cloud to the other one. So there's room uh, for optimization. In terms of complexity, instead of having to chain all those uh, long jobs, and, uh, yeah, and manage uh, error and retries. We just have only two steps, ingest data and do the rollups. And the data is now actionable because it no longer requires you to write uh, Spark jobs or complicated stuff like that. Uh, you can just leverage the SQL query. So. Uh, Basically, anyone with basic SQL knowledge could leverage the data and use it. And finally, uh, we are now uh, we are having a single rollup instead of partial rollups, so uh, we can combine everything and we can combine all the dimensions and answer questions we were not able to answer previously. And I would like to conclude this talk by congratulating the wonderful team uh, that work on this. Uh, so this is the analytics team, and thank you for them. Uh.